If you go by the letter of the law, or at least what some fans think, the best matches are always held for pay-per-view, and back in the day that used to be true, because that's what Raw and SmackDown were there for. It was all build, 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 build. Then you had your big event, and you know, the showcase, the marquee bounce would be so good, you would just throw money at the wall, and then realize that's not how you paid for a pay-per-view. You'd make that right, you'd sort it out, and you'd hope to be wowed. But because this has been going on for so long though, there have been times on free television where you get fights that are so good, it reminds you why you wanted to be a wrestling fan in the first place, plus you kept some cash in your pockets, everybody wins. So because I fancied winding some people up today on the internet, because nobody will agree, my name's Simon Miller, this is What Culture Wrestling, and these are the 10 best wrestling TV matches Ever. Number 10, Randy Savage vs. La Parker from July 7th, 1997 on WCW Nitro. So now look before we do continue, remember this, a good match isn't necessarily a five star technical classic, but instead how it makes you feel and how it makes your emotion runs wild as if you're Hulk Hogan. That's exactly what the macho man Randy Savage and La Parker did in 1997 when they clashed in a WCW Nitro ring. Because this was in the height of the NWO and Scott Hall was out there and they were too sweet and be like, oh, New World Order is the best, New World Order is the best. And if you were a fan like me, you were terrified about World Championship Wrestling because how the hell were they going to fight back? Well, one man did have a plan and it was the strangest plan in the history of the world because as soon as these two started fighting, the commentary team here, complete with Tony Schiavone, were on top of the games because they was like, huh, La Parker looks a little bit stockier this evening. I guess he's been eating some pies. And the other part of this that nobody saw coming was when La Parker grabbed his mask, ripped it off, and revealed himself to be none other than Diamond Dallas Page. The fans went absolutely nuts, Simon Miller went absolutely nuts, and it was like the first proper shot back across the bow of the NWO and went to show this wasn't a bunch of stupid good guys running around. They had a plan, it was so well done, it was so well executed, and given what WCW would be doing a couple of years later, I, boy, it makes no sense. Number nine, Phoenix versus Nick Jackson on AEW Dynamite from November 20th, 2019. Now I know this isn't everybody's cup of tea, but if you are into fast paced professional wrestling, where guys just go, 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 and do flips and tricks and jumps that most of us would never be able to dream about, well, you could do far worse than this. And it went to show that despite being in really good tag teams, Phoenix and Nick Jackson are just tremendous professional wrestlers. There was also plenty of story here as well because Matt Jackson was out of the game at the time with a bad back and this was Nick Jackson's first singles wrestling match in years so you were worried what he was going to do. But when Phoenix tried to put on a Canadian Destroyer and Nick managed to like roll out of that and apply a sharpshooter, don't tell me you weren't losing your mind as well or at the very least going, well, that was pretty damn technical. Wanna know why? Because it was more technical than Scrabble. Nick Jackson also kept going going for tags out of instinct, which is such a good little thing to throw in there. And I will die on this hill. Sometimes when you talk about best matches ever, and you do one from like the last 12 months or so, someone goes, well, it can't be that good if it's new. That's not how these things work. It does apply when it comes to the Super Nintendo. But otherwise, prove me wrong. Go watch it and you come tell me. Number eight, FTR and the Young Bucks versus the Lucha Brothers, a Butcher and the Blade from AEW Fighter Fest Night 2, 2020. Once again, a match where people's athleticism just ruled the roost. My favorite thing about this was the narrative. I'm a stickler for a good story and this had it. Because look, it was nice and simple. FTR, they're a ground-based team. They're old school guys and they were sick and tired of seeing people leap through the airs. So here, they were gonna try and stop that arsenal as best as they could. And damn, they sure tried, but they didn't come close. It's also a massive trump card that AEW has because they only have four pay-per-views a year, so they need to make sure that they do elevate the matches on free television, which right now, or at least recently, they seem to be able to do on a week-to-week -week basis. So this was both spot fest and narrative substance pushed together, and I don't think I've ever seen that. And if nothing else, it has that Canadian destroyer spot. There's nothing I can do or say to try and convey to you how good it was. Go to YouTube, type it in, that's why it's here. Mainly that's why it's here. How the hell did they come up with it? Number seven, Triple H versus Chris Jericho, April 17th, 2000 from WWE Monday Night Raw. This one is just brilliant all round. If you wanna see audience members losing their damn minds like that, you should go put on the WWE Network, type all this in, and wait to have a rollicking good time. Because this all came down to the fact that it was a world title match between Triple H and Chris Jericho, and the fact it was on Raw kind of planted the seeds in most people's bellies, where we're not gonna see a title change, 
but imagine that we did. It's what the live audience certainly bought into, and there was a tease here because Triple H for Gurium had been winning all his matches thanks to outside interference. So what did the Ayatollah of Rock and Roller do? Well, he went and found Bradshaw, he went and found Farouk, he paid them the money, and now the APA were his hired bodyguards to ensure nobody got involved. So with all this in mind, when Hunter Hearst Helmsley did get pissed off with referee Earl Herbner and gave him a push, he pushed right back. That allowed Chris Jericho to take control, hit the lion salt, and after the fastest three count you've ever seen in your life, he did indeed pin the WWE champion. And for at least a few hours, well, an hour or so, we thought he'd actually done it. It is one of the biggest pops ever. As it would turn out before Raw was over, this was a dusty finish and Triple H would be your champion again. But once more, if the whole point of wrestling is to buy in with every single feeling in your body, you'll cry watching this. That's how good it is. Number six, Triple H, X-Pac and the Radicals versus The Rock, Mankind and Too Cool from February 7th, 2000 WWF Monday Night Raw. Aside from everything that happened with Stone Cold Steve Austin and Vince McMahon, this may be the very pinnacle of the Attitude Era, given those who were in it and given the reaction the fans gave it. Because you had The Rock, who was one of the most popular wrestlers ever, you had Mankind that everybody beloved, and on the other side of the ring, you had The Radicals, and fans were still trying to work out how this had happened. They were WCW guys, what were they doing in the WWF? And you may laugh at Too Cool, but I tell you, go and watch them in the year 2000. They are over like Rover, just because they danced. And the reason that this does hit the highs that it does indeed do and make its way into this list is that it's just, I mean, it's nuts. It's absolutely crazy. It's like taking adrenaline and injecting it into your face. Both the wrestlers and the audience can't contain what they're doing to the point that it sometimes seems like you see things before you hear them, but that's only because your brain and your eyesight can't keep up. Go and watch it when The Rock suplexes Triple H on the outside. It's like you've entered another dimension. So it's all about excitement, atmosphere, and aura, to be honest, but that's what the Attitude Era was all about. Even now, actually don't go and watch it now, because at the moment we have no fans in the building. When you actually witness this, you will want to take your head and smash it into the wall. Number five, The Undisputed Era versus Moustache Mountain from July 8th, 2018 NXT. Talk about being at the right place at the right time with a crowd who was willing to buy in to absolutely anything you gave them and a crowd that understood what top tier professional wrestling really was. Because the not often seen team of Moustache Mountain in NXT were able to win everybody over with their crazy good tandem offense to begin with. And Tyler Bate especially just stunned the crowd with his crazy strength, even though he doesn't look like that big of a guy. From there, Kyle O'Reilly and Roderick Strong just turned on their, oh yeah, we're really good wrestling button. And for a company that for many years hasn't really given two hoots about tag team wrestling, this is an incredibly good tag team wrestling contest that everybody, and I mean everybody, even your mother doesn't like wrestling, should go and check out. Trent Seven's cell job is also so well done, I actually believed he was hurt. And just take what you believe like modern tag team wrestling to be, and this is a great template for it. It is unreal. Number four, Sting versus DDP from the April 26, 1999 WCW Nitro. I think when it comes to Legends of the Ring, Sting gets a bad rap sometimes because so many people say that he's overrated. Well, on this night, I'm going to say that he was underrated because he took all the good traits on the baby face and he just threw them out there and they hit you right in the face to the point you were desperate for him to win and you were terrified that he was going to lose. DDP was also in great form as he just kept mouthing off and treating Sting like he was nothing but a piece of trash. And they went proper old school here when Diamond Dallas Page was about to hit the diamond cutter because Sting didn't reverse this. Sting wasn't able to get out of this using his last ounce of strength. He grabbed the ropes because he knew if he didn't, it was gonna be curtains. It's those small little things that really get you invested. And the finish too, my word, there is around about a 2,466 tombstone reversals. DDP gets fed up of that, so he goes for another cutter. Sting is able to get out. He hits the Scorpion Death Drop. And honestly, by the end of it, you feel exhausted and you feel overwhelmed and happy that the good guy won. And we forget this all the time, that's the point of wrestling, to support the good guy and cheer when all is said and done. Damn you John Cena and Roman Reigns for making people forget. Well, it's not your fault, but you take my point. Number three, Bret Hart versus the 123 Kid from July 11th, 1994, WWF Monday Night Raw. Right, you need to transport yourself back to 1994 for this one because the 123 Kid who would go on to be X-Pac was not known to the WWE slash WWF audience. In fact, they had no clue who he was. So if you were gonna put this on pay-per-view, nobody was gonna buy it. We all love Brett the Hitman Hart, but he needed a good running partner, and this guy wasn't it. However, everybody in the company already knew that Sean Walton was such a good performer, they had to sell this to the audience 
So what better way than to put him in there with the excellence of execution on Monday Night Raw that was damn free TV. It started off so well too because the one, two, three could use his own weight to get the advantage and Bret Hart didn't get mad. He didn't freak out. He just did this little look on his face like, huh, I didn't see that coming. And all of a sudden, you thought the one, two, three kid was the greatest wrestler that ever lived. We're stupid. It was also broken down wonderfully because while the hitman tried to use his wrestling skill to begin with, the kid kept finding ways to get out of that. So do you know what Bret eventually resorted to? Just punching him in the damn face like, why won't you die, you stupid little child? In name. It's also so influential that if you do watch it, you will see this kind of idea pasted over all kinds of matches that we're watching right now. And really, it's also like one of those things that you can tie in to modern professional wrestling because you had the high flyer versus the dude that had the technical skill. If you've never seen this, you have made a huge mistake. Number two, Kenny Omega and Hangman Page versus the Lucha Brothers from the February 19th, 2020 AEW Dynamite. I know, I know, it only happened about six months ago, so I'm a terrible person. Somebody bury me in the ground. Someone come, just dig my hole, I'll throw myself in, then I'll die and you'll never have to have me talk again. But the thing is, these guys are just so good at wrestling. And above that, they're so good at tag team wrestling. We don't get a lot of that in the modern day. AEW changed it. I just think this is fabu. When they work the Charlie horse into the match, for goodness sake, and after Kenny Omega has reversed that attempt at the Canadian Destroyer on the apron, but then suffers a muscle spasm and then gets Hurricane Rana onto the ground, I'm sorry, I think that is just spectacular, and I don't even know how they did it. If I tried to do that, I would lose my bald, stupid head. It did everything that it was meant to do in terms of getting these guys across the stars, but also doubled down on the fact that people desperately wanted the AEW Tag Team Champions, and this isn't ignoring Pentagon Jr. or Hangman Page either. In fact, ever since February 2020, Hangman Page has just gone from strength to strength, and Pentagon would have done if he wasn't stuck in Mexico for ages. It's just brilliant. What else do you want me to say? I've watched it like three or four times ever since it aired, and I'm desperate to be that good as a wrestler, but I already know I never will be. Number one, Kenny Omega versus Pac from the February 26, 2020 AEW Dynamite. Now I probably have forgotten a few matches here, and maybe this is in my brain because it was so recent, but I can't remember a time when people just put on an Iron Man match on my free television show, and it felt like I was watching some kind of WrestleMania-esque main event. That's how I felt between Kenny Omega and Pac. And just to let you in, I'm very biased towards both these wrestlers. They also had an incredible story before this because Pac had won one of their encounters. Kenny Omega had won the other one, so it was all tied up. And while Pac was desperate for another shot at the cleaner, he was too busy hanging out with Hangman Page being the tag team champion, and that pissed the Brit off then some. They also worked at a frantic pace, and it was the first AEW match to feature a disqualification after Pac had lost his temper and decided he would use some weapons. I mean, he was smart because he then doubled down on that by locking in the Brutalizer and making Kenny tap out again, but he did it and he's in the record books. Kenny Omega would eventually go on to win this, but it was one of those occasions where nobody actually lost because both guys are just too good. And as I am saying these words, Pac hasn't been allowed back into the United States because of the global pandemic. And that needs to change yesterday because I need more of this flowed into my blood. There's a dark way to end this video. No, of any other matches on television that were better than all of these, and of course you do, you hate me already, I understand. Well, put them in the comments down there. Like the video, share the video, subscribe to What Culture Wrestling, then head over to whatculture.com, read yourself some articles, follow What Culture on Twitter, What Culture WWE, and watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you for joining me. Please excuse the sweat that I'm just drowning in, but it's like, I don't know, so hot here, and I'm under hot lights, and I can't handle life anymore. I'm leaving, I'm going this way.